Okay, so we're um, back into our show and tell, our members finds on a weekly basis. I think we had a nice fun winter. We went through a lot of uh, material over the winter. I know I learned an awful lot. Um, we're returning now back to our regular members finds just to work on identifications for the stuff that we see through the week. Although, as I was just saying, I, I haven't personally found a whole lot out there, but I haven't really been looking that hard. It's been dry. And I've been busy at work, so I haven't been putting a huge amount of effort into it. Um, next week, we do have our keys workshop that will be led by Dorothy Smolin. And um, it is a beginner oriented class. Obviously, everyone is welcome to attend, but Dorothy is going to review five different types of keys, five different styles of keys uh, that she has. Um, some of them, as she mentioned, were from older books, but the, the style remains the same. So it'll be a pretty useful thing to, uh, to attend if you wanna learn how to use these different types of keys. So that's what we're gonna be doing next week. All right, um, for tonight, it's a show and tell. As always, we get a cue going of who wants to go in what order. So if you, anybody has anything they would like to share, please type it right into the chat. Oh, go ahead, Dorothy. Um, I'd just like to add too that there are five pages now. I know you can get uh, both the, uh, the PowerPoint I'm going to use next week and the page on, on both on the screen, but it would be better uh, that if you're interested that you let Luke know and he will send you these five pages that you can print out because that would be better if you really want to get the practice because this used to be done, you know, hands-on in a room um, and working with people. So it's a little hard to be able to do it virtually, but if, if you're very interested in these different styles, then the best thing to do is to print out these pages that um, Luke can send you if you're interested. And I'm, a, I'm going to preemptively send them to everyone when I send the announcement out, which I think I'll do. I'll, I won't wait till the day before, like I usually do with the Taxonomy Tuesday. I'll send out the announcement tomorrow so people have time um, and we'll and have time to be able to print. Now, these, these pages, too, are not complete keys. You know, they're just ones that you can use to identify the images that I'm going to show you with some information. Um, so you get practice in using them. Um, so, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. Uh, thanks, Dorothy. Okay, any other announcements? Anybody want to jump in? Luke? Yes, Marcel, hi. Hi. It's so the next Tuesday will be only dedicated to teach how to use the keys, yeah? Yeah, correct. Oh, okay. Got it, okay. Okay, great. Okay, so Lauren, Lauren is the first to go. And then um, if anybody else has anything they'd like to share, please type your name in the chat. Um, I will jump in at some point and share maybe five people, I think, that set me up. So would you like to start, Lauren? Ah, uh, yeah. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. So today was a very exciting day for me because um, this was my very first ever gyromitra. Yeah. I found it in Hunterdon County. Um, unfortunately, I was walking dogs with a friend, so um, I didn't want to be that person that was, you know, constantly distracted <laughs> by what was on the ground. So I did my best to just take a couple of pictures and then move on. Um, I didn't see any others in the area. I don't know how common it is to find others in that same area. But um, I walked quite a distance and covered a lot of ground today. And this was the only mushroom I saw other than all of, you know, the old stuff, you know, the old polypores and stuff. So yeah, this was really fun. I've been looking this for this for years um, and never found it. So this was Hunterdon County. Can I ask what town were you near? You don't have to say exactly where you were. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, what town? It's got to be Cal Town. It was Teeter Town. Teeter Town, Mike's. Oh, okay. So Califon. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, I lived in Oldwick for twenty-five years or so, and uh, oh. I have to say, I 
in like 30 years that I was in New Jersey, I think I saw gyromitris maybe twice. Oh, so wow. That's really quite an interesting find. Yeah, it, it was really, really exciting. Um, so this was, this was it as it was in the ground. Yeah. And then the next picture is <laughs> what happened when I picked it up and it just completely crumbled in my hands. And I'm wondering, is that normal? Well, it can be, yeah. It just fell apart right away. Yeah, it's kind of brittle flesh, yeah. Yeah, but you can sort of see the chambers inside, yeah. Yeah, huh. so that's it. And it was the only one I saw, so. Yeah, I was, I'll add to what Susan was saying. You know, I find them only once every couple of years. And when I do find them, it's one or two of them in a season. That's in the Philadelphia area. So they do seem pretty uncommon in our region. But I will also note that it always seems like these come up and then a week later, you start really finding morels. That's my personal observation. Now, are you saying in general or in the same area? In general, but... Uh, well, also in the same area. I usually, I would find morels where I've been finding these things the week before. Okay. No, no guarantees or anything, but. Yeah. So what do we think that is? Is that corfei? Yeah. yeah that, that would be my guess, but you know, like Dave will always say, you got to have a microscope and a good key for this, and I don't have that. Yeah, and of course. And of course, right now, there's a lot of work being done on these. And I know they just described a new species in the Midwest. Uh-huh. My species up here is, I, I call S, Gyromitra esculenta, and it's much um, darker brown, but much the same kind of convoluted shape. And this, this was pretty small. It was probably not more than two inches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, mine are much bigger usually. But they're fun if you see them young and then as they get bigger. Oh, okay. But that, like I said, I, I, for me, the Gyromitra esculenta, which is darker brown, is much more common where I am here at the Adirondacks and it's always under conifer trees. Okay. But yeah, I'm, I don't know, I'm not knowledgeable enough on the species of the Gyromitras. Yeah, I always, I always call this corfei, but that doesn't, I'm only, you know. Yeah, me too. I'm not super confident in that, but that's where I would at least start. Mm-hmm, right. I'll type the name in there. Oh, great find. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else wanna jump in there? If not, I'll share my screen and go right to Maricel. Okay, I'll do that. Are you ready, Marisol? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Number one. I am showing you five crusts that I found in the in March this year in my neighborhood. Um, so this one is used to be called Himenocaete. Mm, Corrugata, but now they changed the name. So it's Hypnoporia, Corrugata. And this one presents itself uh, sometimes with the asexual stage. This is the, the, the sexual stage. And um, the asexual stage is called the, the gluing fungus, the blue gluing fungus, something like that. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> Because when it appears, it glues branches together. This is the sexual stage. And um, when you touch it, it's hard. When you look at the lens, it is completely crowded with setae, brown setae. Can you please show them the, yeah, the setae that is um, pointy? So I just did the, the micro to show there that is what I am saying it is. Can you show more, please? I think, that, oh yeah, I got the spore deposit. The spores are not too big. Hmm. And, and then I did this one um, in, um, I think, 100X, just to show how crowded it is with the setai. 
And this is in water. So um, the cross is really colorful, like dark amber is beautiful. So you said the asexual stage of this is? The one that's called the gluing crust, something huh. like that. I'm trying to find that. I can't seem to find a good picture of it. <gasps> that's, I've never, I'm, I, I, I see this kind of often, but I've never, I can't say I've ever seen that asexual stage or. I found it once, uh, like two years ago, and it looks like um, it's completely resupinate and in zones like turkey tail, but it's completely attached to the wood and it's gluing branches. Oh, and it's, so yeah. it starts out white, but becomes black, huh? Dark, like, yeah, darker. Okay. Yeah, I put in gluing crust and I now I'm finding pictures of it. Not that many though. It's an uncommon I mean, program. I don't see it reported too many times in the group in Facebook. Huh, that's cool. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look for that one. All right. This one belongs to the same family and the photos are a little blurry, but you wouldn't believe how small the fruiting bodies were. But I knew, I thought I knew that one and it's Imenocaete rubiginosa. This one didn't get the name changed. Like the one before belongs to the same family. And the fruiting bodies were maybe like one centimeter big. <laughs> I couldn't get a good photo. They were too tiny, but still I managed to get the spores and I got the setae, so you can see that in a little tiny branch. I tried uh, taking a photo at home and it didn't work. So there is the setae again. The setae has thick walls and it's wider uh, towards the base. And this is done in water, so it's very colorful. And again, the 100X magnification, just to show um, that it, it bears a lot of setae. You can see the setae with the lens. I couldn't get too many spores, so it's a little hard on the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like two. Because the protein bodies were really, really tiny. And it has hefa that is yellow. You can see there a little tip with double walls. This one can grow big fruiting bodies. I found it just so very young. All right, cool. Okay, here's the next one. This one I found in, in with the other um, hymenocaetes. And um, when you touch it, it stains. You can see on the photo, it's kind of watery. And it has a white margin and it's warty. And somehow it has some kind of a main wart on the center towards the right. It's because at this moment, several units probably uh, came together, coalesced, coalesced. I don't know how to say that word. Mm -hmm. That sounds right. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So the micro is beautiful. This one has a kind of uh, cystidia that is called dendroifidia, which looks like a naked branch. And it has uh, lamprocystidia. So this one right here is a type of um, cystidia with incrustations on the tip. So you can, when with the lens, you can see that is sticking out, giving like a nice appearance to the crust. That's the best I could do in water. You can see the incrustations in the left. I got a good spore print in water too. And I put melsers to see if what kind of reaction it had and it made this weird reaction. So what you can see is the inside of the, po the spores. It's hard to judge with this photo, but there is an outline, outline for the shape of the spore. This is inside the spores that the melser changes like that. And more of the 
lamprocystidia, which is ornamente cystidia, sticking up, it's called exerted. And that is the dendroifidia, which looks like branches without leaves. And boy, that crossed clams. At the end, it's broken, but at the end, I can still show that there were clams. The clams act like a valve to, for the delivery of nutrients passing through the hypha or hypha. And this um, dendroifidia, this, uh, this cross was so tough to, to, to smush it against under the slide. It was really, really tough. I don't know if the, the dendroifidia does that, make it a really strong and hard fruiting body. So you have the name uh, Pino Four for this. Is this like? It looks, it, looks like giraffe spots. <laughs> yeah, the abobadia. But it's not. It is because it has dendroifidia, and it has uh, this uh, ornamented cystidia. It's called dendrophora. So dendrophora and Pino Four are yeah, different they, genera. They separate them. Yeah. Just for having the the branches like the structures, dendro dendrophora versiformis. Is I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow you. The lamprocystidia is that the defining that, that, feature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That splits them, and then also the branching. Mm -hmm. The branching the makes it move to dendrophora. Okay. Because that's called dendroifidia. Okay. Not the lamprocystidia. No, the lamprocystidia because peniophoras have lamprocystidia and other crusts too. So, without using microscopy, could you really separate that out from the albobadia? I can't say that. I don't know if albobadia has the dendroifidia. I have to check. Hmm. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mangalocystidium. Hmm. Okay, I found this one with the other crusts and near my house in the side of the road. It's like nobody goes in that ever. It's, it's virgin <laughs> and it has mixed woods. And this one was a big fruiting body on an unknown deciduous tree, decorticated and rotten. And um, you can see that it's kind of thick and smooth. And it, ha it thins towards the edge. Can you show more, please? You can see the fruiting body. And I got another one showing the whole thing, the how big it was, several centimeters in length. Mm -hmm. So um, the spores are a little bit ornamented. You can see that the, the edge is not smooth. But I couldn't I didn't get to the species. I can't find the information. But I got to the genus based on some other microscopic elements, the megalocystidia. That's the megalocystidia. It's huge wavy cystidia that crosses through the flesh. Mm -hmm. All right, megalocystidium, everyone. Here you go. And this one is like an ascomycete or something like that, or is the asexual stage of a pesisomicota thing? I just don't know the right names. So I thought it was a crust because many crusts are like that, like almost transparent, like a very thin layer of dusting of um, something there. So when I did the micro, I have found this one before. It's called dictio, dictio caeta. And the microscopic um, um, features are beautiful. It has this conidia. Can you show the micro? Um, so what you see right there is that a spore is being burned at the bottom through a collar. 
that is like a, an angular color. Can you point to that, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the color is, uh -huh. Uh -huh. so when the spore is forming, the end of that coni conidia, whatever name that is, it becomes a little fatter. And then somehow the spore is pushing out. And the conidia, the brown stem like structure, has setae, is erect. And can you show more? So we can see other spores are weird shaped. And you can see the neck, the color, I'm sorry, the, the neck color thing, yeah, where the spores come out through. Is that stained? Yeah, I use blue, uh, Congo. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What's the name for the blue one? Congo, uh, methylene blue or cotton blue? Cotton blue, cotton blue, I'm sorry, cotton blue, but the structure has its color is brown. So it is stained only the tips. Mm -hmm. You can see the base on the top. It's like a fatter base, uh -huh. yeah. So it's troops of them. In, making giving the wood that whitish aspect yeah and very rotten wood you can see <laughs> wet and rotten awesome okay well thank you for yourself sure. <laughs> okay okay who was next looks like sue was next Well, I know you're going to get bored with these, but I just get the biggest kick out of them. Uh, this one I showed last week, this same exact little fruiting body. But this week it's kind of gotten a little bit more wrinkly, but also somebody took a bite out of the uh, upper corner at about one o'clock. Uh, I found quite a few today that had bites out of them and some were, a couple were tipped over. But um, with luck, this may swell up and that black center part should flatten out and form the spores when it's mature in about another two weeks, I would guess, if it doesn't get eaten all the way. So Sarcosoma globosum. And here's a little pair of them. I put the quarter down just so you could sort of see the real size. And uh, it's very typical that wrinkling around the um, edge where the from the black center. Um, the one in the lower part if you look sort of at about seven o'clock, that is where its black disc is. It's with luck, it's gonna sort of grow and face upward more, but for the most part at the minute, the black part is facing away and down into the ground a little bit still. But it's not uncommon to see a couple of them fused together sort of like this. It's beautiful. I love it. Thank you for sharing. I love the. Now the I can't look at the skin. It's just so interesting. Wrinkles. Yeah. And the texture. That's what makes it able to swell up and hold a lot of water. Oh. Sort of wrinkle up if it dries out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's just so interesting to see how it, how they adapt to whatever the situation was. And none of these that I'm showing you were frozen, but a couple of them were still a little bit frozen inside, but mostly they're kind of soft and jello-y like. And I think I have two more pictures of- Susan, wait, don't, don't move. Please come back to the, that one. It looks like made out of a thick fabric. Like some yeah. other things that when the fabric is really thick, it's so beautiful. So uh, it, it sort of feels like that in that the skin has to sort of hold the gelatinous material inside and yet be very flexible. I would say that the skin is about an eighth to a quarter of an inch thick. Mm -hmm. And it, as like I said, that center black part will eventually open out wider. I hope if I'm smart enough to be able to take pictures of some of the same ones as they grow over time. Do you ever do this for? Huh? Did you ever work on the spores? Just to no, I haven't. Oh. But maybe this year I'll try and do that. Oh, okay, okay. I do have a microscope, but I, I, it's a pain in the rear to use it. <laughs> okay. But I, uh, I will. Off, I know they won't spore for another couple of weeks, 
as they sort of start to flatten out and then eventually they flatten out entirely and then curvel yeah. up. The skim just sort of just sort of collapses and dries up. Yeah, this one is very young. Um, he's a little bit bigger than a quarter. I, I took another picture with the quarter, but I, I chose this one because it seemed to be a little bit sharper. But see, that, that skin will eventually sort of wrinkle as he grows bigger. So his little opening there, which is the black part, which hasn't developed very far, is, is going to, um, it's about a half an inch across, a little more than a half an inch. But you can see he's, he's still in his growing stage, which I think is fun. Um, and then the, the last one, uh, I just had to show you the somebody ate the top off, ate that black part. And uh, so, you know, I, I probably a red squirrel because this particular area is full of uh, Norway spruce and Norway spruce cones, and there's a lot of middens where the um, uh, squirrels have left the, you know, uh, seed casing kind of stuff. And uh, I think they've sort of been browsing in this area. And so this gives you a good picture of what the material on the inside of this thing looks like. And of course, this one was also very young. You can see it's about the size of a quarter. And so its skin had not really developed very far yet. So it's not very thick skinned. I did not pick any of these. Uh, I kind of want to see if they get eaten all the rest of the way, because I go in there about once a week or whether um, some of them can sort of swell up anyway. This one obviously won't throw any spores because that part of it is eaten away. So the, the fertile part is very small in relation to the rest of the fruiting body? Well, it's, it's that black disc that forms on the top of the thing. Uh, the whole yeah. thing oh, okay. is like a balloon to hold up the disc, Ooh. which is uh -huh. where, like a cup fungus. The disc is oh. like a cup fungus in that it is the surface where the spores form. And the rest of it is supplying the moisture and the structure to sort of get it above the ground to throw those spores as it matures over several weeks. Beautiful. Very interesting fungus. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So last week, um, you know, they, there was still some snow around. I, oh, sorry, Sarcosoma globosum, somebody who's faster at typing um, could do that. Um, I, today, the trail was much clearer. We've had much a, a lot of above uh, freezing temperatures, but because these trails are so beaten down by snowshoers and uh, cross-country skiers, and also this trail is pretty narrow in some places, so the ice is still thick on parts of this trail. So um, I was not able to get to my sites three and four. Yeah, thank you, Dorothy. I'm not fast enough to do that while I'm trying to think. <laughs> but definitely an interesting fungus. And today I saw, let's see, I wrote it down, uh, 14 in the first site, 17 in the second site plus two, and then six, none at the third site and six at the fourth site. And that's usually, the fourth site is the one that um, is the latest to get started because it takes longer for it to warm up and melt the snow and ice around it. Uh, and that usually has the most of the fruiting bodies. So I'm anxious to see. And here it's only like April 6th. And by the end of April and into May, there should be a lot more. So I get a kick out of it. This is my spring activity is watching these things grow. Do all the uh, habitats have the spruce? Yes. Yes. But they also, because the stands are... Um, what I would call maxed out. In other words, the trees are at their full maturity and a lot of them are um, subject to wind damage. Uh, so they've been falling down and I have to do a, quite a lot of bushwhacking to climb over the, the fallen dead trunks. Uh, and there's one spot I can't even get back to, you know, an area where I know that some had grown a few years ago because the tree damage is so great. Um, oh. But anyway, it's mostly spruce with an understory of balsam fir. And then there's a few big white pines thrown in. Um, pretty much not any deciduous trees, uh, except, well, no, no, in this particular area, 
and this is along one trail, but it's a, at least a half mile stretch in various places along it that I've been watching them for quite a few years. So anyway, that's all I have to. Great. I know they're crazy looking though. But. They're fun to see. Yeah, they really are fun. Fun to watch grow. All right. Well, thank you, Susan. Uh huh. Is John available? Have your picture, John. John Huber. I do see one John in there, but I don't see him on the camera. Okay, we'll skip over John for a minute and see if he gets back here. In the meantime, oh, Virginia. Hi, Virginia. Hi. <laughs> how, how are you? <laughs> okay. Okay, these are all from Kentucky. Uh, I collected a couple of years ago, but I was just working on them this last month or so. Um, this is a parakeena. Um, these are all on decaying hay bales, moist culture, uh, moist chamber cultures from decaying uh, hay bales. So, so as you can see, this one is almost a donut shape, which is characteristic, although they do come in slightly different shapes. Um, sometimes just little circles and sometimes more extended. So uh, next, another picture. Okay, this is the, um, these are the spores. Um, and as you can see, this is the capillitium, which looks a lot like barbed wire. It has really, uh, this is not the best picture I've ever seen of them, but it has spines on it that sometimes are very, very long. Um, although it's so small, it would, you couldn't hurt yourself on it. And the, the um, yellow brown here is part of the peridium probably. And the light, um, generally bright colored spores. And there's a perfect donut. <laughs> Very cool. A donut or a Cheerio? <laughs> yeah, Cheerio. <laughs> yes, it's like, it's like a Cheerio too. Beautiful. How big are these, Virginia? <sighs> They're well. That's micro under the microscope, um, dissecting scope. So they are they are rather small. Um, this is a piece of straw, you say? A piece of straw. This is just um, hey, It's not any particular um, quality hay. It's just the field was mown, whatever grass and weeds were were in the mm -hmm. field. And the hay bale was sitting out there for a couple of years and decaying. So I just gathered some up and put it in the moist uh, culture from moist chamber culture. So, okay. And then next one. Okay, and this is from the same one, the same culture um, showed up with um, two or three different species uh, and all tracheales. Um, this is a view from the top and it looks spotted. Um, it has a stalk, which you don't see in this picture, but it's um, Hematrichia pardina and Pardina means spotted like a, a leopard. And this is another view mostly from of a different um, fruiting body. And this one is a little more bumpy. Um, with a stalk, it looks almost like um, medieval mace. And it, this doesn't really have the dark spots on it. This is just another one from the same um, the same batch and I did not make a um, I did not make any squash <laughs> uh, on the slides because there were only 
two or three fruiting bodies on it. Here's another one with the bumps on it. It's still a pretty amazing photograph. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. these have got to be incredibly tiny, right? If that's a They're very, very tiny. You could you'd only see them if you looked under dissecting scope, I think. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. I like the description of the mace too. That's very yes. appropriate. Uh, that's what I thought it looked like, a medieval mace. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one. Okay, this is one we've seen before, but it's another one from the decaying hay bale from Kentucky. This is Parakeena depressa uh, because it's flattened. And you can see the, the edges of it um, where the um, top of the peridium would split off. Okay, I don't know if I had a microscope. Yeah, there it is, that's the same. And this one that has the golden, you know, bright, you know, bright colored spores. And this one, the capillitium is just rough looking. It doesn't have any spines on it. So uh, there was one more that I always find on hay bales, Parakeena, um, I can't think of the name of it right now, but uh, they all, I seem to find these always on these hay bales, Parakeena or Hematrichia species. Okay, so. Does the hay have to be very old? I never, we don't, we only go out there about twice a year and I oh. have a chance to get fresh cut hay. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also have seen this parakeena depressa on other litter. I'm oh. not sure about the others. They, they might be found on litter in other places. I'm sure they are. So. Yeah, beautiful. Mm. Very nice observations. Okay. I have a few here. So these couple that I have to share are not from this year. They're from last year. I really didn't, haven't been out too much this year for various reasons. So I looked up on my iNaturalist, which I was using a lot last spring, and just found a few things from April. So this is the end of April, but I picked ones, <clears throat> more common mushrooms, but ones that I found were really young. So this is a Cereoporus squamosus, the dryad saddle. And in this picture, it's not real obvious, but this is growing on wood. It's wood that's all covered in moss. So it's a polypore and these things will get really big, but these are little tiny things right now, just two inches across maybe. And of course, this thing will turn into a big shelving fan like thing that could be up to like a foot across within a few weeks. This is what they look like when they're little babies. So if you were inclined to eat it, that would be about the size you'd want it to be, right? Because it's tender. Yeah. Yes. I would not eat it, but I never find it when it's that tiny. Yeah, you know, I eat them every couple of years. Um, and then I realized why I don't eat them more commonly. Yeah, I was going to say, and then you remember why you didn't, don't <laughs> right, bother. But, yeah, I don't really care for them that much, but they're not like, they're not horrible. They just have a kind of a weird taste that I don't really particularly find attractive, but some people seem to like them. So mm -hmm. they're worth trying. And they are nice and tender like in this stage. I mean, they're like little marshmallows. Yeah, that's a great picture. Really. All right, so that was the dried saddle, Seroporia squamosus. So these are uh, wine caps, Strafaria rugoso annulata. And again, this is at the end of April, but these are just little buttons. And if I'm gonna eat these, these are when I usually would eat them. Um, when they're still like caps or just starting to open up. These are barely opened. Or no, I'm sorry, they're not opened. These are caps that are not even opened at all. But you can see right there, I don't want to keep shifting the photograph around too much, but you can see that annulus, that cogwheel annulus that's like starting to kind of like hang out from underneath of it. And as that cap opens up, that annulus will stay on the ring and it'll have that very cogwheel looking uh, pattern to it. Luke? Yeah? How do you make these? Um, 
you know, I usually just end up sauteing them. Like when they're when they're really young like this, I usually just end up sauteing them, not getting any too fancy. Now, I have once or twice gotten a little bit fancier and like made them into like curries with yogurt in them. And they're good like that, you know, over rice. I think I did that one time, carrots and yogurt and like cur like some kind of curry powder in there, like an Indian curry. Mm. Most of the time they just end up in a saute pan. So the, these always grow on wood chips or almost always in wood chips and woody debris. I think these I found on the side of a, a path where it was intentionally mulched. But sometimes I find them actually, I find them in one park where I go to where they keep it fairly clean in there and uh, where they um, chainsaw the wood there'll always be lots of like really fine wood chips and they seem to like that too. And sometimes though, when I find them, they're not always this wine color. Sometimes they're more of a yellowish, golden yellow color on the cap. But we should start seeing them pretty soon in the next couple of weeks. They kind of bleach out as I remember on the color of the cap. Yeah, you know, I, 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 that might be one way of looking at it, but I do remember Gary Linkoff saying that there's a couple strains of them that actually yeah, are, are different colors. Yeah. So sometimes yeah. they're wine color and sometimes they're like a kind of a golden straw color. Right. They're also one that um, is sold through some of the cultivating houses to, to grow yourself. Yeah, they're supposed to be really easy to grow. I've tried. And... Well, I don't know how easy, but I have a friend here in Saranac Lake who is, has been successful at getting them to grow. I, I guess when I say easy, I, I should mean easy in terms of growing mushrooms, <laughs> easier of the mushrooms to grow. I personally have not been very successful with them. Look, there is a question. Oh, can, I, can somebody read it? I can't really see the chats. It says, are they any look alike to the Stropharia rugosu anulata? Oh, that's a good question. Are there any lookalikes? I mean, there's lots of things that look similar. But the, the veil is very special. I don't think so. Yeah, I guess, you know, if, I mean, if you're really pretty experienced and you're looking really detailed, I would say no. But if you're um, not ex very experienced, I mean, I would be careful of some of the other agar, like agaricus species out there that would look similar. I don't know. Does anybody else? Have any comments on that? Just a, because of the variations in color, sometimes you sort of, is that really what that is? You know what I mean? Well, one of the identifying things which you, that you can see in your screen at about seven o'clock again is the nice long route into the wood chips. Mm, yeah. They usually come up with the, with the whole fruiting body when you pick it. Any other comments on this? I'm just Googling the uh, lookalikes, see if anything comes up. Well, the thing that'll be out at the same time, but it doesn't really look at it, but in the same habitat are various species of agrasibes. Mm -hmm. They're kind of more indis you know, indiscriminate and kind of brown spore. As I remember, this is kind of a purple brown spore print. Right, so that I'm reading really quickly right now. Right. On one. Agaricus would have three gills and this doesn't. Ah, there you go, yeah. Oh, I don't remember that. So Midwest Mycology, I think that's a group, a club, on their page, they're saying there are no reasonable lookalikes to this fungus. No other mushrooms that have a burgundy red cap with purple gills. So I, I, I guess the answer to that is there's Reasonably speaking, no, not really. Purple black spores. I mean, uh, gills. Yeah. Well, I think they start out pretty purplish and they get darker. And they're really fresh. They're really kind of a purple color. Like if you crack these open, they'd be kind of pinkish purple. I remember they taste really good too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like these. I think they're good. Okay, then I included this photograph. So we always think of chicken of the woods, or I, I used to always think of chicken of the woods as a fall mushroom, but I 
actually find it pretty reliably every spring. Well, that of course is sulfurous. So this was at the end of April last year. Um, and that's just kind of a, that's what it looks like when it's first coming up. When you first find it when it's like super, I always call it like a marshmallow stage because it's what it looks and feels like a marshmallow coming out of the wood. And I actually probably need to leave that another couple of days to grow just a little bit because at this point it's so soft. It's almost too soft to really work with. You know, it just kind of melts in the pan. Another day or two, it'll start to firm up a little bit, but the window on that can be really brief. Or somebody else will just come and grab it. Yeah, and also <laughs> it'll, it'll increase its volume too. So you'll have more of it. Yeah. So, but these do grow in the spring, just not as abundantly as they do in the fall, but you definitely find them. So I guess they're pretty, uh, pretty, um, they react easily to the weather. You know, like the cool wet weather. At the many bio blitzes in the spring that I've been on, um, we used to find what they called Betaporus cincinnatus. And that didn't have, you know, it was a more pinky on top because it didn't have the yellow underneath as well. It was pale underneath. But now they're saying that that cincinnatus is the same as sulfurious but it was um, very common in the spring. Okay. All right, so I included this one. Now this is not my observation. This is from somebody I'm friends with on Facebook from Delaware County, which is right outside of Philadelphia. And this is from this year, this is from April 4th. So from two days ago. So this is right outside of Philadelphia. I thought I would share that she has observed uh, morels growing in the Philadelphia region. Now look how little they are. <laughs> That's an almond. This is an almond she has there. I can't imagine how she spotted it. <laughs> I don't know. Growing <laughs> on the ground. Yeah, seriously, look at them now. <laughs> so tiny. But if you see one, you stop and you spend time looking for more before yeah. you step on them. Mm -hmm. And if she's lucky, nobody else knows that spot. Yeah. And she can let them grow a few days. Yeah. So look, that's her fingertip there. So. Yeah. So morels are starting. Look, these actually look like they have a little tiny bit of size on them. So. Yeah. So this was two days ago outside of Philadelphia for everyone's reference. So morels mm -hmm. are coming up. What kind of they are? Um, I think I think they're going to be Americana. Right? They don't look like black morels to me, but I don't know. I rarely ever find black morels, and I definitely have never seen them when they were that small. Too young to tell yet. Yeah. yeah. That's, that is what the Americanas look like when they're young, though, the yellow morels. Did she but, happen to say what kind of trees were around? I'll look in the comment. I don't know. Although I can see, judging by this general... Um, uh, habitat, the cel cel uh, what they call that, celadine. You see, it's like I think that's ground ivy. It's probably tulip poppers because I live very close to here. That looks like the ground. Oh, I, yeah, just that looks that. that looks like the ground cover of. Uh, no, she didn't say they have arisen. That's what she said. <laughs> so anyway, I thought I'd share that because I'm sure everyone's anxiously awaiting that. And the last one. I included on here to see if anybody actually could help me with an ID. So I photographed this last year in April under conifer here in Pennsylvania, here right outside of Philadelphia, Bucks County. Um, and I didn't collect them, but these were growing on the ground underneath a conifer. I have no idea what they would be. So they're not very big. And the gills are attached. Can I ring a bell for anybody? There's not much to it. Mm -hmm. All right, well, whatever it is, it was growing last April underneath the conifers in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll see it again this year. 
Okay, that was it for my stuff. So I'm going to circle back around to John. Are you with us, John? John Hubert. All right, well, we'll look and see what he sent me. It says on scrub root. It's just one photograph. Yeah. So if you are listening, John, looks like you have a Ganoderma, probably a Cartesii, right? No real stem and non deciduous wood, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what it would be. It would be Cartesii on deciduous wood growing like that, that kind of pattern. It's got kind of that bluish color to it that Cartesii often has. So. All right, that is everything I think that people have sent me. That's on the stick in the lower left corner, of his shot there. Uh, yeah. All right. Oh, a lot of uh, focus, but this stuff, right? That's what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think it is? Sterium or something? It would be a guess. <laughs> no. hard, it is hard to tell. No focus. Yeah. Okay. I am out of material now. So, is there anybody else with anything to share? Didn't see anybody else. All right. So next week, again, um, I'll say it again because I think about 10 more people joined us from the beginning. We are having our keys workshop that Dorothy Smallen is going to run. Um, so we'll not be sharing finds for next week. So we'll collect everything we find for the next two weeks and share it in two weeks. Um, the Keys Workshop uh, is beginner oriented. Everyone's welcome to attend. I will send out an announcement tomorrow with um, the materials that you'll need for it. There's five pages with five sample keys on it in different styles that you will need to, uh, to print out for the get the most out of this class. And Dorothy will show us how to use those different styles of keys. And then also next week um, on the 16th, Roy Holling of the uh, New York Botanical Gardens, I believe is where he's best known from. Um, he's also the Belit guy. He's doing a lecture on us on Belit's of Australia. So he's been traveling to Australia almost every year for the past, I forget what he said, 20 years or something. Um, and has learned a lot about bull leads in Australia. So that'll be a nice little uh, trip around the world for us. All right. So, I don't know, anything else? Anybody else wanna chat about anything? You're pretty quiet today. We're pretty quiet, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of mushrooms out yet, Yeah. you know? But it's certainly nice to see everyone. I, I've been really looking forward to these things. Yeah, me too. Nice to see I you. Love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. So. This Friday's talk, I didn't make it. The wax cap. Yeah, she was really good. Yeah, she was good. Okay, was that one recorded? Does anyone know? They were recording it. I could see that it was being recorded, but I haven't gotten a link for it yet. Okay. So, yeah. But if I do get a link, I'll send it out right away. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I would need that too. Thank you. Sure thing. Yeah, she was really good. Okay, doke. Well, I guess if um if that's it for tonight, we'll all wrap it up and look forward to seeing everyone next week, right? All right. Thanks, okay, happy. All right. All right. Take care, Luke. Everybody. Right. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Bye bye. You too.